Thank you. Are you kidding me? Get out of my face. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a hot, hot, whoo, incredibly hot edition of ARG Presents. Tell them why it's hot, the Brent. Because the BBC Micro is on fire. Also, it's 100 degrees in the house tonight. Oh, yeah. yeah, that too. But hey, I'm not laying down for you or anybody, brother. This is a battle. This isn't just any battle. It's a BAM ARG battle. The sides have been chosen. It's the BBC Micro in a hilarious battle against the all-powerful BAM PC Engine. The PC Engine, Brent. We're going to go mono mono. It's funny. When one looks at this battle on paper, it looks like an un unbridled beatdown for by me on you. But if you look at really? the, if you look that's at how the, you see it, huh? That's right. Okay. If you look at the cold hard statistics here, who to thunk it? I never really thought about it, but these systems were sort of around in comparable time frames. I mean, they were actually <laughs> going at it with each other in a weird way. As long as you don't look at release dates, I agree. <laughs> they were, they, but they were contemporary to in certain, uh, more or less. You know, so here we are. This is the ARG battle. Tell the folks how this is going to go down, the brand. And we are going to make our case on what was the best, the most influential, the most important system between the PC Engine and the BBC Micro. We're going to display our facts for all to, to share in our knowledge. All right. And then in the chat comments below or on the Twitch stream as we do it live, yeah. we're going to let people decide which was the better, most powerful, most influential system between the two. You know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to lie here. I, right. I'm going to win, but... <laughs> I don't have, this isn't like previous battles where I literally didn't like the other system. Like, I, I love the PC Engine, and I also like the BBC Micro. So, but, but I mean, listen, someone's got to go. And I'm afraid it's going to be uh, the BBC Micro this week. Now, why did you choose the BBC Micro of all the different things? you? Because you wanted a computer versus console battle. Why the BBC Micro? What drew you to that? Because we've only covered that one a handful of times on the show. We have. And, you know, before uh, this battle took place, I had an inkling of the importance of the uh, uh, power of the BBC Micro. But it wasn't until I really dug in there to get the cold hard facts that I realized just how incredible this little system was. Um, why did I pick it? I don't know. I thought it deserved a shot. I think it's. I think it can swing a lot, a lot higher than its weight class. Wow! That's there you go. Sure. Very gutsy, gutsy call. I chose the PC Engine because it's double awesome with loads of great crap that came out from the time it started until the time it folded up the tents. This thing should still be a big deal, except they sort of dropped the ball, which we'll get into. When we, get, <laughs> we won't get into it much, though. If you know what I mean. But it should be a good time. Uh, like I said, it's it's. And this is a battle where if you look at it at face value, you can think to yourself, what the heck is this? But, you know, there are more to, there are more to these items than just gaming. And there are other, there are other uh, aspects that you have to get into that one system can do that the other can't. And sure. that's, that's the basis of what we're going to get into today. So, with all that said, uh, I will lead the dance. Absolutely. Uh, because... I feel like dancing, brother. When you play this system, you feel like dancing, you feel like jive, and you feel like getting down to funky. I'm going to be battling for the PC Engine. I'm going to give you a little bit of cold, hard factoids about the PC Engine. Because everyone loves cold, well, hard you, factoids. Listen, I think there. I think this is a uh, uh, pr something that's part of the conversation here. So, sure. Uh, and some of the stuff people might not know. So the PC Engine, as it's known in the States and a few other places on, on the planet, the stupider named Turbo Graphic 16, which I, never, I always thought that name was dumb. And they had to get the number in there for the stage, you know, yeah. but I, not the bad mouth moan thing. But uh, so. Uh, I'd like to start this debate by saying well, that my system's garbage. So here's the funny thing. So, of course, the PC Engine came from Japan. Yes. Okay. Now, Japan uh, birthed a lot of great consoles over the year and computers. Uh, in 83, the big dog came to town. That was Nintendo. Yes. They came out in Japan with the family computer, the Famicom. And they really sort of took the took Japan by storm with the Famicom. It was a huge deal at the time. It did real well. But that thing got older. And so other people were like, you know, they're making pretty good bank here. 
you know, what can we do to get in the ball game? And one of those companies that were looking, that were sort of hanging out in the weeds, was the was NEC. Yes. Okay. NEC was like, you know, we want to get a piece of this action, and we think we if we come in at the right time, we can capture a lot of the market. They saw that the uh, uh, that the uh, Famicom was getting a little bit older, and there was good. They, they knew everyone knew there'd be a, a, another console yeah, coming, and a gap between. But yeah, there were those rumors of when it would come out were there, and they thought that they could get in there, come in the back door, and so they decided to get, give it a whirl. Now, at the same time, there's a company called Hudson Soft. They had developed uh, the technology to store. Uh, software on basically ROM cartridges, mm-hmm. right? Inexpensive, like uh, cart. They were real thin uh, they, cards. They, they were expensive. Well, they were in more. They were cheaper than cartridges. Okay. Okay. Yes. And they did it, and they were also reliable. They could, they were they, you could use it for multiple applications. Which we'll get into. So Hudson saw was like, hey, Nintendo, how's it going? Look at this. We got these. And Nintendo was like, take off. We don't. We're not interested. And so NEC was like, hey, let's have a look at that. And they were like, oh, these OO cards look pretty good. We're going to use these. Because they saw NEC was sort of, believe it or not, and we'll get into why this is hilarious now, but they were sort of playing a long game with the PC Engine in a lot of ways. So the PC Engine, they put it together, and it debuted uh, in Japan in October of 87. Okay? So by this point, the Famicom had been out for four years. Um when the when the PC Engine came out, uh, they were sort of the fresh thing on the block, basically. And when they came out, they were pretty much instantly successful. Within the first few months of sales, you had five hundred thousand PC Engines released or, or were sold. Sold. I don't mean like sh- they had them in a warehouse. Yeah. They were gone. Uh, ultimately, this console sold uh, five, over five and a half million units. Very okay, good. this was a huge. Uh, Boone. I'm guessing that also includes the Turbo Graphic. That, 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 uh, yes. Yeah. That doesn't include the CD-ROM systems. Now, yeah, right, yeah. So you've got the PC Engine. What do you got here with the PC Engine? Well, what you've got here is one of the smallest, if not the smallest, uh, game machine around. Uh, this thing was a weird combination of an 8-bit and a 16-bit machine. Uh, and... They kept it small, and there are various uh, there are various ideas as to why. I'm guessing they kept the price down with it was one of the reasons. But also, uh, it, it worked for this thing. That they had, had they went a different style with the way it looked. The Who card uh, slot in the front. It has one joystick port, which we'll get into that. But it also its secret weapon was it had this gigantic multi-port on the back of the system, which had all your video, all your audio, and a bunch of data lines and some other yeah. stuff, because this was put on the system with the thought that, okay, we're going to be able to expand this thing in the future. They had ideas of what they wanted to do. Um, so, eventually, what those ideas were, were it was to release a CD-ROM. And I'm not going to get too deep into the CD-ROM, because I really didn't want to focus on that, but it was a peripheral that was very successful. Sure. CD-ROM units uh, that were PC Engine based, like your Turbo Duos or what, they sold uh, over two and a half million uh, uh, boxes of just those. So it's a good, it's a good run. And about half the software released the PC Engine was on CD. Why was the CD a big deal? Because a lot of places ended up getting CDs. Well, they were very clever here, and this is where the Who card technology comes into play. Uh, the Who cards could be substituted for memory cards. So when they've got a CD-ROM in this thing, they could put memory cards in there, uh, and they 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 would uh, double, triple, or even like I think it was like sixteen times as much base memory on the system. When you're adding that much memory, like the PC engine, the humble little PC engine with the CD-ROM could have half as much memory as a Neo Geo, which is quite impressive. It is. If you think about it, absolutely. Yes. And so of course a lot of this, they also were they. Really, that they weren't the first CD-ROM to come to the table, but they probably were the best utilizer of the CD-ROM uh, on a console in that era. I mean, it, we could say, like, the FM Towns Marty had one, for example, the Amiga CD32, but, I mean, the PC Engine CD blows those things out of the water, and the CDI, I'm not going to count that one. So having a CD involved in the mix uh, gave this thing a lot more playability. If you wanted a joystick expandability, that was there, too. You have to get, basically, a breakout joystick board, this is a flaw in the system. I'm not going to try to defend it. it it's been thorn in my side even as uh, today because these things aren't, aren't cheap to get. Um, the uh, 
the CD the the system went on to a pretty good uh, pretty good run. They ran it they ran it until ninety four. It's funny though, outside of Japan and in Japan it was dominant. Yeah, it knocked well, the fam- well it knocked the Famicom down, yeah. and until the Super Nintendo yeah. really got a foothold. It was leading the pack. Like it was, re- it was beat the Genesis. It was beating the sixty bit machines for a little while, which is impressive. Outside of Japan, it was not quite as successful because it doesn't seem like they could decide what they wanted to do. They wanted to have a foothold in the states, but by the time they got here with the campaign they established, uh, it just wasn't doing all that well against the the new beefier sixteen bit machines. And then in the rest of Europe. They kind of, sort of released it in certain places. I mean, it didn't even get to the UK until 1989. It didn't get to Spain until 90. So, I mean, that, that's, you gotta think that thing had been out for a couple years uh, by that time. And that, they really, why even expand in the market at that point? Well, I mean, they wanted to get some of that action. I didn't realize this because I thought the PC Engine was the was the console that got released in the UK. But from everything I read, they also got a Turbo Graphics 16 there as well. So I don't know. If they, I don't. So who knows which is more uh, prevalent now? But I mean, I thought that was kind of strange. Uh, finally, uh, they ran these off in '94. This is pretty much the end of the line to give way to their next uh, idea. Their next idea uh, did not do well. Was the super graphics? We've touched on this before. This was sort of a, a wacky sequel that where no one at no one at NEC could figure out exactly what they wanted to do, and what they ended up doing was putting out a thing that just bombed. I think it had a total of five games. Like we played two of the five, maybe six, uh, and the, the games were okay. But I mean, it's just they died. It was weird looking. It was just a dud, a dud. And then they went on from there to PCFX. We're not going to get into that. So <laughs> with all that said, you've got what you've got here is a pretty, a pretty successful console in Japan. Now, we both are looking at systems that were really successful in one spot and then had uh, variable success in other spots. So I think we could call Absolutely. that Absolutely. We could call that, uh, could call that one a draw. So... There, that is a quick look at what you've got with this thing. I'm going to go over the technical specifications just for the people that are interested in that. Uh, the CPU in this thing, it's an 8-bit uh, Hudson CPU that runs at 7.6 megahertz. Uh, it's got a dual 16-bit GPUs, and so there you get that 8-bit, 16-bit. There was a lot of discussion. Is this an 8-bit? It's sort of both. Eight. Uh, the 8-bit uh, Hudson processor can go. I mean, it's a good. I mean, it can. It pumps a lot of action. If you play this thing now, it feels like it, you're playing something faster than an 8-bit machine. That's for darn sure. Uh, it's got a very l- large color palette, 512 colors. You can have 482 on the screen at once. That's very nice. Uh, you've got uh, now. In America, this thing came with a crappy output, so I had to jury rig mine. This is another problem I had. There's a special adapter in the States to get this thing to have composite or component, which you have to pay for. This is another thing they did wrong in the States. It was a botch, which I didn't like, but I'm, gonna, so I'm just going to call it out. Uh, it had a real nice sound, a t- 5 to 10-bit uh, stereo PCM, a 6-channel wave table, uh, and the sound processor was another uh, Hue. It was a Hue 6280A. Right? And so memory... 8K of main RAM, 64K of video RAM, but of course, you could actually upgrade that with the Who cards if you had a CD-ROM, and then the Who cards could hold 2.5 meg. If you think about that, that's quite astounding. Some of the games in this thing are absolutely remarkable, and they're not very big games. It always blows my mind that you could keep, that you can uh, get, uh, get well, these sure, games Well, sure, yeah, yeah that, for the era, yeah, that's exactly how it went. Yeah, so... Uh, I want to talk about some of the games that were available uh, for this machine, and I've tried to be fair about it uh, here. So, what I did was um, you don't you don't got you don't got you don't well, got to lighten the blow for me, buddy. I'm, gonna, I'm not worried about that aspect at I all. I just want to look at some of the launch games that came out in '87. Okay. Okay. And remember, keep in mind that there was an overlap of, of pretty much the, almost of the entirety of the PC Engine with the BBC Micro, but at that, you know, towards the end, the BBC Micro obviously was, you know, getting real old. So the first batch of games to come out uh, for this thing, I'm not going to go over them all, 
But there were some really good ones in here. Uh, Wonder Boy Monster Land. Uh, as much as I hate to say it, their version of Galaga 88 is good. If you like Galaga 88. R-Type, which is very good. Operation Wolf. Uh, Rainbow Islands. Bubble Bubble 2. Uh, Tiger Road. The aforementioned and the four covered Thunderblade, which was... Ah! <laughs> It was okay. Uh, you know, it was okay. Afterburner 2. These all came out in uh, 87. Um, Darius came out in 87. So just out of the gate, you've got some pretty good classic. Uh, the uh, So what is the PC Engine known for? It's known for its uh, shoot-em-ups. It's known for its uh, uh, shmups. These thing, this thing is the king dong of shmups. If the Neo Geo is the master of fighting games, I think you could safely say that the that the PC Engine is is the King Dong of shmups. And at the time, people had probably seen anything like these things that were coming out. And you had tons of great ones here. It's funny, we actually have owned some of the arcade versions of some of the games that came out for this. It includes stuff like uh, 1943, Arrow Blasters. Uh, you also had uh, uh, Laser, well, the, uh, the uh, my brain turned to goo here because of the heat. Uh, what is that thing? Laser, la blazing lasers? Is that what it is? Blazing lasers? That's what it's called. Uh, great game. I love that one. Uh, you've got pretty much uh, any sort of uh, vertical horizontal shooter you're into, this thing has it. It's got all the stuff you need. Now, it also went into areas you wouldn't have thought it would, uh, including stuff like, yeah, you know, it's funny when you've got something that spans the gap from stuff like Pac Land all the way up to stuff to like Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition. This thing does. This thing has uh, uh, a lot of games that were people would consider exclusives, even though they're not. Stuff like Bonk, which is Bonk, is a game. Not, you yeah, it's definitely not. You associate though. with with this. It's probably the mascot game in the states. But a lot of people don't realize Bonk was released on a bunch of systems, yeah. including the Amiga. Got yes. you know BC Kid, but Bonk, the Bonk series, Air Zonk, Bonk Two. Those are all great games. So you've got some good platforming in there. You've got your legendary acts. Then you've also got a lot of like your role playing stuff. When you get into the CD stuff, especially, you're going down the road of like the the E series and the, and the uh, uh, the more traditional RPG style stuff because that stuff didn't fit up. that That's great just playing on a card. Yeah. Uh, you also uh, hilariously you get stuff that you would have heard of from the states. Stuff like TV sports. Cinemaware eventually was pretty much effectively bought by the by the uh, NEC and Hugh, I think it was Hudson actually bought them after they went south with their came from the desert. I will say the the, the PC Engine killed my favorite company. Cinemaware killed them dead, but they did really have some releases on this thing, including TV Sports uh, Basketball, TV Sports Football, a lot of great games uh, to talk about on this thing, uh, and you know. I'm not going to go into all of them. You know, if you've played this thing, you know what they are. There's a ton of great games. This thing's well known for its speed, its beautiful graphics, and its very good sound. The control is spot on. I should mention that the controller for this thing is a great controller. They really were, they were very, they were very cunning when they put this controller together because they put two turbo buttons, like basically two rapid fire switches that you could turn on to control how quickly the fire button would go off, right, yeah. by itself. And I think there were three settings, as I recall. And I love this. I love this. This is one of the problems with playing the emulated version of this. You don't get that controller. And that really, the games, a lot of games, hey, listen, I know you're saying this, but a lot of the games use that. They knew that you had that, and that was part of it. It, I made, it made the games a lot of fun. So I think that was a, a pivotal p part of the entire package. So I think that's pretty much all I got to say about it. Like I said, it ran over at 94. These things are prized right now. If you get one uh, on the open market, uh, you're doing something. I looked, you can get, a, I saw people buying boxed versions of this for around 200 bucks. I was surprised it was that cheap, frankly. And then I saw uh, unboxed versions, your mileage may vary versions for around, around 100 bucks. So not too bad. I picked up a TurboGrafx 16 having never played one and never played a game on one, but I saw one at a pawn shop when I lived in Charleston, and I picked one up, and I had one game for it for years. Yeah. And, it, and the game sucked. It was a puzzle game. I never heard of it. Uh, but eventually, I, I managed to get to some computer shows, and I bought some... Uh, I bought Bonk and a few other games, TV Sports Basketball, uh, and some other stuff. But eventually, like most people, I got the multi-cart for it, which is one of the best things I've ever bought. 
I love that game. I love that bit. It makes it great. And so this is what it's just it's fun to go and explore and stuff. Because I'm not mentioning the hordes and hordes of Japanese language games that are on this thing. They're all, I mean, they're just like good luck sucker, but some of them are really fun, you know, and so a lot of that stuff didn't get translated over. So it's a lot of fun. Again, downside, two players is a problem. Also, if you're going to play something like Street Fighter, the joysticks are going to cut it. You're going to no. get something that's going to have, you know, they had second. It yeah. knew its role. Right, it right. Was a, it was an arcade simulator at home. Yeah, it was. But a great, a great machine. Think about this thing. It sold seven and a half million copies in, uh, or product in total. A big number. Great machine. And I think it's easily the king dong of this competition. Now, I believe you had some uh, uh, comparisons. You want to go into those now? Yeah, let's go ahead and look at those before we get into mine, and then we'll all transition sure. into mine. So I looked to see what games I could find. And you were very fair about this. Yeah, I looked to see what games I could find that were on both systems. I found one. There are more than one, all right? But I found one easy comparison, and then I found one that's sort of pushing the boundaries of both ends, but I wanted to be fair, okay? So... The first uh, comparison we've got here is Ballistics. Uh, if you have, uh, have you uh, watched the Amigos, we actually did this, we actually did this on the Amigos for the Amiga, uh, and Ballistics is a game where you, uh, by psychosis, where you shoot a ball around in a maze. And I think this does a pretty good job of showing you the gap, game-wise, between the BBC Micro. Now, and, Aaron, do you know when this was released? I don't. I don't know off the top of my head, I don't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up while you entertain the thing. Uh, so, this is a game where you shoot the balls and it'll go. It's sort of like a real remedial version of speedball, I guess, but crappier. But if you look at the on the left here, if you're watching at home, and if you're not, I'll explain it to you. You've got sort of a, a light, almost a CGA-looking uh, uh, play field with light blue and kind of a crimson as your primary colors. Uh, and, you know, you get what I would call not that smooth scrolling. If you look on the right, you've got a beautiful... Scrolling, you've got very smooth scrolling. You've got a lot more action in terms of stuff on the screen. Uh, you, you've got a just a better looking game overall. I will say, uh, I did check out the sound on both these, and I thought they were, uh, I thought they were not. I thought the BBC actually has some halfway decent sound. And having seen some demos and stuff on the BBC, I know it, it it's capable of some pretty decent action. Uh, but, I mean, it's not in the same stratosphere as the PC Engine. Did you find a year on that? It looks like this game was released in 1989 yeah. and included the uh, e uh, Acorn Electron, the Commodore 64, the TurboGrafx-16, DOS, Amiga, Atari ST, BBC Micro, and Amiga OS. Yeah, so also I want to make mention of something else. When I was looking at games, and this isn't a slight, this is just the truth. When I was looking at games to compare... I noticed, of course, you're, because the, the BBC Micro was around for a long time, but in terms of their game output, I mean, it was practically nil uh, when it went At out. I mean, like, so sure. the year this came out, there were a handful of games, and they would be they would be coming a lot less frequently uh, as the as the uh, thing wound down. So anyway, that's your that this is the standard non uh, not accessorized PC engine that gets the standard BBC Micro now. I did a second comparison here. Now this one's a little bit wacky. Okay, so this is this is something I thought to be fair. We have augmented our our machines. Now this is Prince of Persia. Uh, now this is available on the BBC Master, which uh, Josh Malone 40K Ram brought to Boat Fest. If you happen to see it there, uh, and the PBC Master is sort of like, from what I, I gathered, from what I was told, it's sort of a jacked-up version of, of the BBC Micro. On the same token, Prince of Persia wasn't released on the on the vanilla PC Engine. It was on the it was on the PC Engine CD-ROM. So it was a CD-ROM game. So I thought it seemed fair to have uh, um, to have these things together. And Josh just chimed in to tell me that the BBC Master has a faster CPU and four times the amount of memory, which I'm sure that's what made this available. I should also mention that uh, uh, this was released on the BBC Master just a few years ago, uh, and this is the one-level demo. Now, if you look at these side by side, uh, and the reason I put this out here was just to get an idea of what you could, what conceivably could have been done uh, with the Micro and the Master. Uh, and I'm looking at the Master sort of like I'm looking at the PC Engine. The PC Engine, of course, has extra memory as well, 
So you're it, there's I'd say it's a, f a fairly decent comparison in terms of upgrading them both. But I wanted to put it in because I thought it, I mean listen I'm going to give the devil his due. I thought the the BBC uh, Master Port of uh, Prince of Persia was real nice. Yes, I thought it looked real. Very I was fluid. surprised how good it looked uh, and how well it and how nice it sounded. I can tell you if you're listening on the radio. Uh, the the uh, uh, BBC Master version has the intro, and everything pops out like you'd expect, but one thing you wouldn't expect is the fact that it moves real well, very quickly. And uh, they've done a great job with texturing all the uh, graphics on the stones of the prison. I mean, this is not generic by any stretch of the imagination. They've done a real good job. And, of course, the uh, PC Engine CD-ROM, I think, also did an excellent job. Uh, their their prints is a little more heavy on the outlining, you know, like the the line around it was a little. Yes. You see that on some versions, uh, but I think it also looks nice. I, I, it's funny, but I think maybe that the PC engine uh, prints moves a little jerkier yes. than the BBC Master. I was going to mention that the frames for the micro definitely seem like they are uh, uh, more fluent. Uh, more well, uh, better animated, that sort of affair. Yeah, I was real surprised to find this when I was looking for something to compare. You know, I love this game, and I think you're a big fan as well. I, am, I know yeah. Boat doesn't like it, but I think it's great. And so the fact that you can play this at BBC Master, uh, and I had no idea it was a PC Engine release, uh, I, I found that to be quite special. So I think this is a much more favorable uh, comparison for the BBC Master slash Micro uh, than the uh, uh, than the other game, Ballistics. And with that, Aaron, I'd like to uh, uh, take the reins here. And Please. I want, I want to talk a little bit about the BBC Micro. Go for it, man. Uh, since we're already talking about games, yeah. uh, <clears throat> the BBC Micro had roughly 1,900 games. Okay. Okay? And uh, Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. That, that is... Now, of course, some of that is going to be re-releases of the same... Title, that sort of affair. Basic game from a geek that right. he wrote in the, in the kindergarten. Yeah. But that, that goes, without even diving into the games, there's going to be something there for everyone if you want to go looking for it. It's actually a little overwhelming because you can get lost in the crowd. Um, but I want to talk, I want to back up from that, and I want to talk about the importance of the BBC Micro Aaron. <clears throat> and I want to take you back before it. I want to take you back to about 1978-79. All right. The UK is behind the times, the nicest way we can put it. And it is an era where the general public is concerned. They know of these computers that, that, that automation is coming and they're worried that automation is coming for their jobs. And that is, in large part, due to the explosion of computers everywhere else around the world. And uh, the government was like, crap. We are, we... That sounds like the government. <laughs> <laughs> we are kind of screwed here. Our people aren't picking up the computer, picking up these systems, becoming programs, becoming engin computer engineers like the rest of the world is, and even in the short time that computers have really started to grow, the UK has fallen terribly behind. And they, the government said, listen, we, we, got, to, we got to stop this. We, they were smart enough, credit where credit's due, they were smart enough to see this is the future. They didn't know in what capacity. They didn't know, you know, how far-reaching it would actually become. But they knew that if they didn't get their people on board on what a computer was and, and what you can do with it, that they're going to fall behind the times. So they say, we need a computer that will introduce kids, teens, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. We need to get them comfortable with technology. It was it didn't need to set the world on fire. In fact, it needed to do the exact opposite. It needed to be affordable and approachable. And the BBC, the the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, government funded as you know, uh, they said, "Listen, we are going to hold a tryout. We're going to throw the net out there. Whoever can bring us a system that we can mass produce and introduce to the public to, to push, that's what we're looking for. And the government 
and the uh, the computer industry responded. And I'm not going to go into the big or long story about it. Long story store, short, uh, the uh, Acorn won. And they took their system that they were building at the time through a little, a few little tweaks in there, and it became the BBC Micro. It was badged the BBC Micro. Now, that's one thing, right? That, that, that the government says, okay, this is the computer that we're going to start pushing to people. But it went so much farther than that, Aaron. They had television programs, like on-air television programs. They had live television programs where you could call in and get programming help, hardware help, software help, all these incredible... And this, isn't, this didn't like run for a few months and was over. This ran for years, years and years. Uh, they pushed them into schools by giving a, a subsidy 50% discount on all the computers because they wanted young kids, elementary school kids, to start understanding what computers are about. So this literally, this machine jump-started thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids into, into learning about computers. Now, did it? it's not like it was some kind of crazy revolution because you still had to have a good teacher that would push this stuff to you and you had to have engaging content. Uh, but the BBC, they went above and beyond to get this machine into classrooms, into people's homes, into the workforce, and then nurtured it once it got there. So it's no, it's no exaggeration when I said this machine literally saved or helped save the UK from computer illiteracy. Mm. And there has been programs about this. There's been studies about it. It was that big of a deal. Now, good flick to Microman. It was. Well, and, and, and fortunately, Microman, while somewhat uh, uh, accurate, it did, of course, flub it a little <laughs> bit for the sake of entertainment. Jet but, set freaking <clears throat> Willie. But the actual, <laughs> the actual importance of this cannot be understated. This was a big deal. Overstated. This, yes, thank you. Um, so, in 1981, this machine was released. And there's a Dash 1 and a Dash 2 version of the machine. The Dash 1 had less memory, sold for cheaper. The Dash 2, of course, had more memory and was a little more expensive. For the most part, no one messed with the Dash 1. Because the Dash 2, at least when I'm talking, I'm talking about schools, businesses, that kind of thing. And the reason why was the government was giving you 50% off. So it was cheap and, and, and accessible as it was, right? Because you because of the big savings. Sure. So <clears throat> this gets into schools. And it is teaching kids about programming that stuff. But they made so many incredible choices on this machine, Aaron. So many incredible choices. First thing was the build, right? If you look at a BBC Micro, it looks like just a keyboard with a box. It doesn't look like it has any ports. It doesn't look like it has any inputs. It doesn't look like it has any of that stuff, right? Because all that stuff is in the back or, cleverly enough, under it, yeah. accessible with ribbon cables. And this was to keep little prying fingers out of poking things they shouldn't be poking. Brilliant. That's thinking ahead. Now, there is a port on the keyboard that uh, uh, you can pop off, and many of those were popped off. It was a, 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 a pop-off on the keyboard. It was meant to be popped off and had access to an expansion port. Yeah. Uh, those were often popped off a little by kids, uh, but it didn't do any damage or it didn't hurt the machine. Um, they also had the volume control on the machines only adjustable from inside the machine. Yeah, that one I know. And, <laughs> and smart move. That sounds ridiculous, right? But the reason why they did it was so kids couldn't crank up their system yeah. because it had a speaker in it. Um, the ports on this machine are incredible. They're incredible. There are so many smart ports. But the one I really want to focus for on, Aaron, is the tube port. Okay. Are you familiar with this? I Maybe. Okay. The tube port allows you to connect other types of processors to the BBC Micro. Oh, okay. So what I'm saying is 
you could take this machine, right? This BBC Micro, and you could buy a PC chip upgrade, plug it in with a cable, and it, it would set beside your machine, and you would, for the most part, have a PC, a P freaking C, right there. And for the most part, you could buy the BBC Micro and this expansion processor cheaper than you could get an IBM computer. Hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. And that is what helped with the longevity of the BBC Micro. And this was ran from 1981 when it was released until 1994. Yes. Can you think of any standalone PC that has lasted that long outside of just modern day PC? Well, the, the Atari 8-bit was around for a oh, long time. Oh, I don't know, Aaron. And this had everything that you would need. It had all your ports to plug in, all of your accessories. One worth I'll, I want to point out because it saw it in action. It looked awesome. They would have drawing programs yeah. all, that you for teaching the kids lines and angles and all that garbage. There was a turtle that you would plug in and it'd have a oh, pin yeah. on it, I've seen and it would thing. actually draw on paper what was on the screen. That's pretty cool. That yeah. is perfect for engagement for children. Obviously, this has educational games out the wazoo. This has. Uh, a bunch of just throughout the era classic games that pulled a lot from the arcades. It had uh, things that it probably should not have had. Things like Elite uh, that really it was a good version of Elite too. It, it really was the launch. It was the original yeah, version, right? Yeah. Or was and, it the Atom that had the original? I know it was one of the two BBC show uh, BBC games. <clears throat> but on top of all of that, Aaron. Yeah. It had expandability. It had literal cultural changes within the BBC, within the UK. It had games. All I mean, were some of the games great? Were some of the games bad? It had so many games. It encompassed all of them. It had original games. It had arcade ports. It had ports from other systems. You could plug in a processor and get a ZX Spectrum. It had a good, real keyboard. And the most important thing for that good, real keyboard, Aaron. Well, something that the BBC Micro is known for, but it needs to be known for more, is type-in games. This was an absolute beast in the type-in market. It got so much press. It had new. It had television programs where you would type along with the TV program, magazine, books. It had all these things because it wanted to push people to learn programming. You could not in a million years, sit down and do all the type-in projects that are out there. There are tons, tons and tons. And it got the pub, it got out there and got the public excited. Now, just like you, to be fair, there are some sour notes in the BBC Micro. The BBC Micro was having all this huge success, right? Yeah. And they, they in the first like uh, three years, they sold like a million units. Big time. It, this was growing. It was in schools. And they said, man, we're going to take that success and we're going to America. Bad move. <laughs> because America already had their preferred systems and the BBC Micro came over and it bombed. This, and is, I, this is where good crap comes to die. And I don't mean kind of bombed. I mean, it was almost career ending for the BBC Micro, uh, for the company, a Acorn, because it was so disregarded over here. And they even tried to push, they had television programming to go along with it to, you know, like, oh, this is just exactly what we have in the UK. You can do that here. Come on, let's all get together. <coughs> it got absolutely rejected. In fact, it was rejected literally everywhere else in the world, except to some extent in uh, uh, Australia and in New Zealand. Uh, but for the most part, all 1.5 million BBC Micros were sold in the UK. How did Dick Smith not get involved here somewhere? <laughs> this could have been the Dick Smith Whammo 5000 if they, if they played their cards right. So uh, if you look at raw power, uh, you obviously 
I mean, the the PC Engine was released six, seven years after the uh, after the BBC Micros were released. Right. So it's going to be more powerful. Yes. It's going to have shades of greatness that go past what the BBC has to offer. However, with expandability, with the the network uh, capabilities of the BBC Micro, and I mean, it had modems. It had its own network language to talk to other computers that was used mostly in the classroom to incredible success. To have the expandability that the BBC Micro has, it is miles, miles above what this little box, this cheap little box, could have ever thought of the time when it was released. Mm. Very good. Very good. Uh, very uh, convincing. But now it's time for the cross-examination round, if, if I may be so bold. So, uh, I'll go ahead, and since you just finished, I'll cross-examine for a moment. Now, uh, when you think of the a great British computer, okay? Yeah. What do you think of? It ain't the BBC Micro. Are you talking about the Spectrum? I'm talking about the ZX Spectrum. Okay. Now, so as great as the as you say the BBC Micro is, and it was when you when you look at the scene, when you look at the popularity, the ZX is the clear winner. All uh, right. So well, right no, there, you can no. ascertain uh, a lot from no, that no, no, statement no, 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 no. because the price difference between the two, the, it, it's like saying, "Man, what would you rather drive, a Lamborghini or a Jalopy?" <laughs> hey, I'm just saying. When you call that, it's that's a cost is cost. If no one can afford your super machine, then no one can afford your super machine. Well, it was not a super machine, and it wasn't that it was overpriced. All right. Also, it led a ton of people to the Spectrum. It was because the keyboard was so much better. I'll give you that. There's no, but I'm just saying, even with the crappy keyboard, the Spectrum is the more well known, the more well loved. All right, so we could agree on that. The Spectrum is the one everyone talks about. And despite the fact that, I think the BBC gets shortchanged but, uh, more than a little bit. I mean, uh, I've, I have played enough micro games to know that they're, I can't figure out why they're not, it's not a bigger deal in 2023. But I'm, I'm just going to say the Spectrum is the, is the king dong over there. So there's that. Secondly. But not, maybe sales wise. Okay. Go ahead. I will let you continue. Sales wise, popularity wise, and contemporary popularity wise. I mean, secondly, uh, let's face facts here. Uh, I know the BBC was very expandable, but it's a computer. But in terms of console expandability, I think you're underselling what the PC Engine brought to the table. They, you know, direct lines to graphics, direct memory lines, direct data lines, so you could upgrade. You had a memory expansion, which was pretty rare in those days. You had CD-ROM, which is extremely rare. They used CD-ROM to its fullest benefit, complete with the sound. The extra benefits for the CD-ROM, the memory, working in conjunction to bring top shelf games that batted out of its weight class. So I think I don't think this is a I don't think this is a crushing when it comes to expandability. I think both machines were expandable in their general vicinity. Well, I would like to I would like to rebut on that immediately. Okay, you are incredibly wrong. This we're not talking about PCs from 2020. We're talking about PCs from 1981, where expandability might have been adding a disk drive. The the BBC Micro went so far the expandability scope of normal PCs at the time, normal computers at the time, that to say that somehow. Adding a CD-ROM or a little extra memory on a console—a lot of extra memory—is is a big deal. Comparatively speaking, is so wrong. No, you didn't. So you wrong. took that. You totally didn't hear what I said. I said I think they were both very expandable. I'm giving you devil's due. The P, the BBC is very expandable, but it's that, expandable. It's a computer where some expansion is expected versus a console where almost no expansion is expected, it's, and it gave you lots of expansion. You know what I'm impressed for when you talking about console expansibility. The Sonic and Knuckles cart. Not you throwing a CD-ROM on something and being like, "Wee, we well, did it!" Well, the CD. Give the, me a the break. The Sonic and Knuckles card <laughs> is no, no. I'm not taking that. I'm not accepting that argument. I think the the PC Engine a very expandable console. Consoles clearly aren't as expandable as PCs because they're a heck of a lot cheaper 80, and they're not meant to it's be. It's eighty one. I understand. <laughs> But I'm saying, I don't think it's a crushing in that department. I think, I think it is so crushing 
It is so laughable that you would bring that up, that it would be somewhat on par, that I'm offended that I you think, think they're that. somewhat on par, frankly. And now let's get to the nitty gritty here. This thing has, well, how many games was it? 7,000, 10,000 no, games, about, whatever. About 1,900. It's got 1,000 text adventures, maybe four or 500 games that involve some sort of hunchback. And then you got some other stuff there. The no, that's P not true. The PC Engine's library, nothing but quality right across yeah, the board. Yeah, they're they're very happy that the arcades was doing well at this time. Hey, that was a because huge seller. Because it was like, boop, 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 uh, boop, the micro let me pull got, some more games the out micro of the has, arcade. The micro has plenty of arcade ports of its own. And, but it also has tons and tons of other stuff. So, does, it so, does, so does the PC Engine. Nah. I mean, if you look at these games, nah. if these were out in a contemporary, if we look at the games from 87 on the micro, I guess the games on the A7 from the PC Engine, it's a it's a mugging is what it is. You know what we should do? We should look at the games from 1981 on the BC, BBC Micro and the games from 1991 on the PC Engine and compare them. Oh, wait, you can't because your system won't be around for another six years. Hey, listen, they had, a, they had an in with the government, too. They were a subsidized system. They had an in with the government. I'm not saying the program wasn't good. The program was awesome. I agree, I agree, but... I'm just saying, when you got the government behind you, big daddy government, and you still can't be the predominant machine in your in your uh, country, eh? I don't know. Not so great. That's the way I look at I, it. I, I disagree. I think when you're talking business and schools, it was the predominant machine. Yeah, but when you got home, people had the ZX. That's right, the because that's what they could afford. Well, there you go. They weren't subsidizing <laughs> the home market for them. And also, if you look at look at the look at the people making games now. I'm not saying there's no BBC market now. Clearly, there is because people they made Prince of Persia. But I mean, the ZX Spectre's on fire, brother. I don't see a BBC next out there. I see the ZX next. I see the ZX being the King Dong over there. The BBC somewhere around the Amstrad level, if you know I, what I mean. I believe that you are just unfamiliar with your source material, Aaron. There are tons of things. There are tons of ways to attach, say, a Raspberry Pi to your to to act as your processor. Oh, by the way, guess what processor is owned by the Acorn people? That's right. It's the ARM on your phone right now. I mean, yeah. you can't see it because your screen's all busted. Well, that's but, oh, you had to go there. But, that's dirty pool right but there. Let me tell you something. That is, they had it all the way back when. And oh, it was man. just brilliant. It won't even come on now. <laughs> Look at this, everybody. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. I'll give you that. Okay, so let's close. Let's close this thing. And I have a bit. one more. Go ahead. Point get I get your last in. shot in, the brand. This machine was the friendliest machine to take apart and upgrade of probably in geek computer before and after. You, it literally had sockets, empty sockets, ready for more BIOS chips. Just you're done. This thing opened with a handful of screws, all the same size, by the way, that you could take it apart and put it back together, no problem. To modify, to add memory, the sockets were there. Just put it in. This thing had empty sockets, Aaron, ready for upgrades because it knew that was going to be something that people were going to do with it, and they did it. Here's the thing, though, and I'll, I'll close with this. And this is a question for all you folks at, at home, okay? If you, if you could keep one of these two machines, and the other ones are raised into the ether if forever gone. Okay. Which one, you, and use this as the basis for what you say. Not because it taught people how to use computers. But you not, can't. Hold on. No, 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 you not can't. because it sold six or seven million units in Japan. Look at the actual library of games and make your decision based on the quality of those games. So we're erasing quality. one system from from history, but we're not going to look at the it. we're not going to look at the incredible ramifications that would come from doing that. Correct. Because let me tell you something: you delete the PC Engine, Nintendo takes over a little faster. You delete the BBC Micro. The freaking UKs over there with sticks and stones trying <laughs> try to figure out how the wheel works. Well, you know, I mean, it might be better for us, frankly, but not good for them. So, while you guys cast your votes, Brent, you know what time it is, my friend. It's wheel time. Let's yes. go. Yes. Now, Aaron. This is a special week for the wheel because I see a bunch of shiny new pieces on the, this band. The board. wheel has been freshly updated we got rid of all the gimmicks we got rid of all the procrastination right we have is that added what that was 
We have added games you can't win, medical games, the Acorn Atom. Oh, that was a requ many requests on here. Video rental exclusives and beautiful but horrible games. Those were all added, and our retro rewind fleet a piece is the Auric. Again with the Auric? I really want to play some more Auric. My God, what is with you and the Auric? <laughs> there we go. That was, a, that was a good manly spin to Brett. And the winner, it's not the Auric, is it? We've got medical games as requested by Chris Fools. The Folds, getting it done. Medical games, now you done, we've played a few medical games on the show. Uh, we played Microsurgeon. We played uh, MASH, you'll recall. We also played your favorite game on the CD32. Oh, gosh. <laughs> One of your all-time favorite yeah. games. So we've dealt, so we're gonna have to pick something that's not any of those games. Oh, well, I mean, there's there's plenty of medical games out there, and I, I already know what I'm playing. Is so. it Theme Hospital? All right, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll pick something else. But I there really like those games. So. Now listen. Uh, I, we've had time for people to say their piece, and we had a couple people chime in here. And I think we could all agree, the brand, that the winner is the PC Engine. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for voting PC Engine. You, did a, you made the right call. It looks like it's actually a tie, frankly. Uh, but uh, it's very close. We'll see in the in the YouTube comments who comes out There's on top. There's another one for the, for the BBC Micro. Yes, we've got time. If you're listening to this after the fact, please drop a vote below. Uh, and uh, see which one. Now, I will say, in all seriousness, uh, the brand, I do love both these machines. I really, when when uh, when Josh 48K Ram brought the BBC Master to Boat Fest, that was awesome. Yeah. I love that thing. And I wanted one because it was. I love the feel of it. I love the look of it. It's something stuck out of time with a beefy, meaty keyboard on it. But I also do love the PC Engine. It's it's just it's the library for this thing. If if of all the systems I've got multi cards for, this is the one I play the most because it's so the games on it are just so odd, unusual games, very different stuff. Man, the Beeb's pulling away here. By my, the way, my, in the chat. My, my biggest problem, Aaron, with the PC Engine. And yeah. I think you'll give me this. All right. If you took away all the arcade ports, I mean, looking at it from a modern setting. Right. If you took away all the arcade ports, because why play a port when you can just play the arcade game? Yeah. And you take away all of the games that you can't play because you can't understand them. I mean, it has a ton of Japanese RPGs, that court, dating sims, that kind of garbage. Uh, you are left with a very small lot. I don't agree with that. Also, when you discount, I hate people that do that. All right. You can't just say, I don't like any arcade ports. Those were, that was the meat potatoes of gaming and home gaming back in those days. Just to say, oh, I can play them now, that's not fair. That's like me saying, well, man, my home computer is awesome. It crushes the BBC. My girl, of course it does, because it's a different time. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be fair. You got to play fair. And by the way, the BBC had tons of arcade ports as well. All right. By the way, it looks like uh, we've gets a close race on these tallies here. It's going to be very close. We'll let you folks, you kind of listeners uh, who catch this on YouTube, to make your decision. And if you are so inclined and you uh, listen to this on podcast, drop us a note anytime at argpresents at mail.com. Also, wheel, we haven't pitched this for a while, so we're going to talk about it now. If you've got any ideas for wheel pieces, uh, stuff like that. Please drop us a note. It's argpresents at mail.com. Yep. It's as simple as anything. M-A-I-L. Ale. By the way, I'm from the Deep South. I don't know if I mentioned that. Speaking of the Deep South, I've only got one thing to plug uh, on this show. But uh, coming up, bam, August 5th, the boys are back. It's BGW Wrestling uh, held in the Taze Valley BGW Arena over the wave pool, right about uh, two minutes from here. It'll be myself and the Southern Dandy, John Bodokar Schaller, calling all the action. It looks like uh, Professor Wrestling is going to be on assignment that day. So it looks like it's going to be a two man booth for this. Uh, I haven't seen too many announced matches, but uh, it looks like it'll be a good show. I see a lot of people here I haven't seen before, so that'll make it a lot of fun. So we will be broadcasting as usual, uh, starting about 6, 6.30. Uh, on August 5th, that's Eastern Standard Time, 6.30 p.m., tune in, free wrestling on our Twitch channel. It should be a lot of fun. And 
I'm getting ready to close the uh, date picking for the International Computer Club. We're looking at early September, and I'll have a final date on our next show for International Computer Club. You're going to participate in the Computer Club this time around? You nope. should do some kind of BBC thing, since you love the BBC Micro so much. What's What do you like more, the BBC Micro or the Auric? Oh, the BBC Micro. Oh, what? Yeah. I can't believe I didn't expect you to say that. So... All that said, we'll be back next week, and we'll be taking on medical games. Yes. Crazy. Don't let us work on you, that's for sure. Until then, we'll see you next time. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.